Hi there, welcome back to lesson two. And in this lesson, we're going to look at our spiritual position. What actually happened to us when we got saved? And remember, I used a scripture in the book of Colossians, and we might actually start there. Let's go over to Colossians chapter one, and let's see what happened to us. You know, when you gave your life to Christ and you received him as your Lord and Savior, you made the confession that I told you in the previous uh, lesson, lesson one. Your clothing didn't change. Your shoes didn't change. But I'm telling you something, though. Your spiritual position absolutely, definitely changed. And this is what happened to you. The Bible says this, that in Colossians chapter 1, verses i'm going to read i'm going to break into uh verse 12 giving thanks to the father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins in other words God translated you and me from the dominion, from the kingdom, from the rulership of darkness. And he brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, into the kingdom of Jesus. This is really what the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ achieved for you, your new spiritual position. And you know, everything you're going to learn in your Christian work, if you haven't, Everything that happens first happens spiritually. When God was going to make man, he first of all made man in the spiritual realm. The Bible tells us it in the book of Genesis. He created them, male and female. That's what he did first. Then he formed them out of what he had already created. Okay, so what, uh, you know, it, it, it's important for us to know that. That spiritually, that's where things happen first before it appears in a material sense. In other words, for you to experience everything that God has for you, it first had to deliver you from the dominion of darkness. So, my brother and my sister, you have a new spiritual position or you acquired a new spiritual position when you gave your life to Jesus. All right, let's move on. And part of that spiritual position is that we have become ambassadors of Christ. Actually, in the book of Philippians chapter 3, if you read down from 17 to 21, we won't read it because of time. I would suggest that you do read it. It would tell you that, but our citizenship is in heaven because our citizenship has changed. And where your citizenship changes the the uh, home country is responsible for you the way a home country is responsible for an ambassador. Do you know that wherever um, a country has their uh, uh, embassy, that embassy is seen as that country's territory. So what I mean by that is this. If, an, if America has a as an embassy in Ghana, for example, that embassy is like being in American soil. If you run into that embassy and the gates are shut, even if you are a Ghanaian and you run into that embassy and the gates are shut, they are not allowed to just go in and get you out because that has become, they have to go through diplomatic measures. That has now become an American soil, even though it is in Ghana. Now, just take that as an example. Your citizenship is now in heaven. You are, you belong to God in heaven, even though you are on earth. Therefore, God is responsible for you and me. Just let that soak in for a moment. When you gave your life to Christ, your citizenship failed to become what it was before and now is a new thing because you are a citizen of heaven and the citizen of heaven and the host of heaven is now responsible for you whilst you are on earth. It is God's responsibility to provide for you on earth. The same way God 
provides or the same way a country provides for the ambassador it sends to another country wow you are an ambassador let's read second corinthians chapter 5 second corinthians chapter 5 look look at what he says here in verse uh, 19 he said that god was reconciling the world to himself in christ not counting men's sins against them and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation we are therefore what christ's ambassadors as though god was making his appeal through us we implore you on christ's behalf be reconciled to god what the scripture is making us to understand right there is that we are now ambassadors you never used to be ambassador before but now you are an ambassador because you are in Christ. Wow. Another thing is, another spiritual position is that your home is now in God. Look at what he says in the book of Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, it says that Paul, Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> that is why the scripture in Psalm 91 applies to us, which says that he that dwells in the in the shelter of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty, and he can say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The reason why we can say that is because our home changed. We are now under the refuge or in the refuge or protected by the refuge of God. Hallelujah. What an amazing place to be. Your spiritual position changed. Again, Jesus himself in John chapter 15 tells us, and um, he makes an amazing statement. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. To go and bear fruits, fruits that will last. Let me read it for you properly. It says that in John 15, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. For everything I've learned from the Father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, verse 16, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruits fruit that will last then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name you now have the authority to use the name of jesus because your new position is in christ i'll tell you something else i'll tell you another thing that happened to you because you may not know this god qualified you for his purpose okay second corinthians chapter 3 in second corinthians 3 i'm going to read from verse 4 it says such confidence as this is ours through christ before god not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves but our competence comes from god he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant not of the letter but of the spirit for letter kills but the spirit gives life in other words god has now made you competent made you competent to do to do what to do good works which god prepared in advance for us to do we are told in ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 you know what your position has radically changed you have radically changed and one of the one of the tricks of the enemy is to tell you you are you're still the same person that you were before you gave your life to christ but that's not true you are a different person your position has changed the way that god sees you has changed who you are has changed the bible tells us that he has made us ministers he has equipped us for service. I have to go back and read that scripture in Ephesians. Turn your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Look at this. In Ephesians 2, from verse 8, it begins to tell us this. For you were once darkness. See? Huh. Oh, I'm sorry. That's chapter 5, actually. But that makes good reading. So let me read that. <laughs> look, look. Look at what he said. For you were once darkness. In other words, you were once not born again. You were once living in darkness. That's what he meant. But now you are light in the Lord. 
When you gave your life to Christ, you became light in the Lord. Now, he says, leave us children of light. For the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Wow, amazing. That just buttresses the point I've been making. But now let me go to the scripture I wanted to earlier on in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to take it from verse 6. But God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Again, that's where you are. You are now seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. <laughs> oh my goodness. Actually, in chapter 1, it tells us first that, look at what it says in verse uh, 19. And his incomparably great power for us who believe, that power is that the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, where far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Then it tells us, and chapter 2 verse 6 now tells us that, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Where? Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only the presence but also if they want to come. That's where you are. That's where I am. In order that in the coming ages, I'm in chapter 2 now, verse 7, in order that in the coming ages he might show Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 7, in order that in the coming ages it might show the incomparably, incomparably riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourself, it's a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. Why? For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know what? When you gave your life to Christ, you may not know this, but I'm telling you it's a fact, as we read in the scripture right here. When you gave your life to Christ, you entered into the place where you can now begin to do good works, <laughs> which God prepared in advance for you to do. Wow. Again, what do we know? The Holy Spirit assures us that we are sons of God. That's our position. You have this assurance in your mind. You know, <laughs> back in my day, it always looked as though either either Ronald Reagan, you know, somebody might say, who is that? Well, it was one of the ex-presidents of America. Or Gorbachev, either one of them was going to press the button and destroy the world with nuclear power. That's what it looked like then. But I'm telling you, when I got born again and I read in the book of Hebrews, how God was going to roll up the earth, how he was going to bring an end to the earth and bring on a new earth, I knew straight away. I was assured by the power of the Holy Spirit that the earth is not going to be destroyed by nuclear bomb. There will be threats. And they'll, they'll get close. But that's not how it's going to work. Even if they do release a nuclear bomb, that's not how the earth is going to be finally destroyed. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews. Let me read it for you. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. You will roll it up like a scroll and like a, like a garment. It will be changed. Now you remain the same and your kingdom will never end. So let me read it for you. This is how it's going to happen. They will all perish but you remain. They will all wear like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe and like a garment. They will be changed but you remain the same and your years will never end. And that's the way that the earth is going to go and the new heaven and the new earth is going to be created as we learn in the book of Revelation. Anyway, again, we are all equal before God and we're heirs according to his promise. You are now an heir. You are now, you are now an heir of Christ's glory that he gave to us. Romans chapter 8 tells us that now if we are children, verse 17, then we are heirs and we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we might also share in his glory. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. That's your new spiritual position. Again, 
What happened to you when you got saved? Well, you become slaves to righteousness. You become slaves to doing good. In other words, prior to this, you used to be slaves to sin. <laughs> but now you are slaves to righteousness. Why? Because God redeemed you by his blood and gave you total forgiveness. And that forgiveness is not only forgiveness of what you did in the past. It's a forgiveness of what you have done in the past, forgiveness of what you will do now, and forgiveness of what you will do in the future. That doesn't mean that we should continue to sin. That actually means that we should humble ourselves and desire to do good. But here is what he says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. He says, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he said to us that, and in him he had made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. fulfillment. Anyway, the point I'm making here is that you've been redeemed, you've also been forgiven and then our hope is in christ i love this our hope is in christ we hope for a better future we hope for eternal life we hope for what is yet to come the bible says in romans 15 verse 13 and the god of all hope will fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the holy spirit our hope is in the Christ. Our hope is in Christ who will return and gather us to himself. I'm telling you that your spiritual position changed. Let me read this to you finally. In John chapter 1 verse 12. I quoted it earlier on but I want to read it fully. John chapter 1 it says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in him, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born, not of natural descent, not of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. You are a child of God. You're not just a creation of God. You are now a child of God. That's why Romans chapter 8, the spirit confirms with our spirit that we are children of God. Therefore, we can say, Abba, Father. That's the, one of the dearest words that you can call God. That's why the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 6, it says to us, this is then how you should pray. Pray, Father, our Father who art in heaven. You can't call, not everybody can say our Father. I know people say that all the time, but he, he's not their Father. They are, every human being is God's creation. That's true, but not every human being is God's child. Not every human being has the spiritual right to call God Father. The only way you can call God Father is if you've surrendered your life to his one and only son, Jesus Christ. If that hasn't happened, he's not your father. And I know that this sounds weird and, and why are you saying that? Because everybody is God's child. No, everybody is God's creation. Not everybody is God's child. Only those who have given their life to Jesus, as we read here, and also, as we read in John chapter 3, only those who have given their life to Jesus, who believe in him, are children of God. And so, they can call him Father. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. We'll pick it up in lesson 3. Before I pray, I want to remind you to complete the uh, questions in the link attached to this teaching uh, so that we know that you have gone through the lesson properly. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're so grateful and thankful for your goodness, for your love, for your for your word and how you explain your word to us and how your word captivates us, Lord. Thank you for our new spiritual position. We're ambassadors in Christ. We're, we're God's children. Oh, yes, Lord. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We are in a new spiritual position. Our home is in God. We are in Christ. Oh Lord, you have, listed, you have lifted us far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion in Christ Jesus, of course. Father, we thank you for our new spiritual position 
in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you again in the next lesson. Bye-bye.